Franz Liszt is remembered as the first true rock star of the musical world. People would flock to his concerts, women would tear his clothing to get souvenirs, audiences would scream after every piece he played. But the rock star life was just one segment of Franz Liszt's long and complicated musical life. My name is Dr. Dominique Royam and I'm a music director, conductor, and music communicator here to help you achieve a deeper connection to the music you love. Follow me on social media at Dominique Royam for more content. Let's start at the beginning. Franz Liszt was born to Anna and Adam Liszt on the 22nd of October 1811 in the village of Rading in the Kingdom of Hungary in the Austrian Empire. His Hungarian nationality was immensely important to Liszt throughout his life, even though his peripatetic existence in his later years threw his commitment into doubt. Liszt's father, Adam, was a musical aficionado, learning to play the piano, violin, cello, and guitar. Adam was in the service of Prince Esterhazy and used to play in Handel's orchestra. Adam also knew Beethoven and Hummel personally. Adam was transferred to be Esterhazy's sheep attendant in Rating, where he kept a musical household playing chamber music among friends. Anna Liszt, Liszt's mother, met Adam in the neighboring town of Mattersdorf. Adam proposed only weeks after meeting her. They moved to Rating and soon Anna became pregnant with Franz. The Great Comet of 1811 came into view while Anna List was pregnant and she thought it was a good omen about the child she was carrying. In Liszt's sixth year, his musicality appeared. Adam was playing Reese's piano concerto in C-sharp minor and Liszt was captivated by it. Later that same day, Liszt sung one of the themes from the concerto from memory. Adam was so surprised by this, he had Liszt sing it again, which he did. Liszt begged incessantly to be taught the piano, but Liszt's parents delayed starting him because they wanted to spare his health. He had been a sickly child up to his sixth year. After the concerto theme incident, Adam took it upon himself to teach Liszt everything he knew at the keyboard. That included the wide range of repertory he had at his disposal, including Bach, Mozart, Hummel, and early Beethoven. But he also made Liszt play from memory, sight read, and improvise at the keyboard. Liszt made astonishing progress at his lessons, and Adam prepared him for a public concert. Two deep influences in Liszt's life date back to this period. One was the Catholic Church. Adam, his father, was a monk in the Franciscan order for a short time during his youth and never lost his piety. He transferred that deep love to his son Liszt. Liszt thought that nothing seemed so self-evident as heaven, nothing so true as the compassion of God. This religious fervor would stay with him for his whole life, leading him to take minor religious orders later. The second deep influence on Liszt was the Roma people. They would set up an encampment outside of Rating, the village where Liszt grew up, and play music around the fire for hours. Liszt found the Tizane music intoxicating, reveling in its improvisatory and impulsive nature. Liszt would later use the melodies and styles he heard around the Roma campfires in his compositions and improvisations, culminating in his Hungarian rhapsodies for piano, which he also transcribed for orchestra. Liszt's first public concerts were arranged by Adam, Liszt's father, in a bid to establish a fund to send Liszt to Vienna to further his study. The first concert was in Odenburg at the Old Casino, and Liszt almost fainted from fever before the concert. He prevailed and played so well his father arranged another concert in Pressburg during the meeting of the Diet or the National Council. This event was attended by a large swath of nobility in town for the meeting. After this successful concert, a bevy of nobles came together to create a stipend for Liszt to study in Vienna. Before this move, Adam petitioned Prince Esterhazy for a change in position to Vienna, which he was denied. He was given one year sabbatical from his position in Rating to take Liszt to Vienna. The Liszt family moved to Vienna in 1822. Liszt immediately started taking lessons from Karl Czerny, who had heard Liszt two years earlier and promised to teach him. Czerny left copious notes about Liszt as a student, calling his playing wild and exaggerated, and putting Liszt on a strict diet of scales and fingering exercises. Cherney made Liszt learn his works very quickly, which made him an excellent sight reader. Liszt also started compositional study under the care of Antonio Salieri, who, like Cherney, taught Liszt for free. Liszt published his first work while under the tutelage of Cherney and Salieri, one of the famous Diabelli variations. 
The publisher Diabelli asked the most famous composers in Austria and Germany to compose variations on his waltz tune, and everyone accepted except for Beethoven. Beethoven later composed his 33 Diabelli variations to great acclaim. Liszt was the youngest composer in the Diabelli Variations Challenge, aged 11. After that one-year sabbatical, Adam decided to leave the employment of Prince Esterhazy because the prince would not give him any more time to be in Vienna with his son. That put the family in a precarious position, and they spent Anna, Liszt's mother's dowry, in their remaining time in Vienna. After only 14 months of instruction, Adam decided it was time to tour Liszt throughout Europe and try to support his family on the back of Liszt's talent. The Liszt family toured through Germanic lands to Paris and to England. Liszt dazzled wherever he went. In Paris, a business deal was struck up with the Eddard Piano Company to supply Liszt with their new seven octave grand pianos in any city he played in, and he started to build himself as an Erard artist. The families of Liszt and Erard became close, and the relationship lasted until Liszt's mother's death in 1866. Around this time, Liszt petitioned to become a student at the Paris Conservatory. Liszt and his father, with the help of Erard, had a meeting with the director of the conservatory, Luigi Carabini. After introductions, Carabini told the Liszt's that he was banned from admitting foreign students into the school to study piano. The conservatory had been swamped with foreign pianists, so much so that the department almost collapsed. A decree had just been signed by the Minister of the Arts that no foreign student would be allowed into the school for piano from that point forward. The doors of the Paris Conservatory were closed to the Hungarian list. Adam and List toured Europe for three years, bouncing back and forth from Paris to other cities and beyond. It was taking a toll on List's fragile health, so Adam decided to take his son to Boulogne to take the waters. Almost at once, Adam fell ill with typhoid fever and died, leaving List alone in Boulogne. He had to communicate the news to his mother and make his way back to Paris himself. List was 16. After the death of his father, Liszt stopped touring and established himself as a fashionable piano teacher in Paris. He was now responsible for his mother and himself, paying all the bills. Liszt would teach all day every day, bouncing between aristocratic mansions, sometimes crisscrossing Paris a number of times in a single day. He would get back to the apartment he shared with his mother after she had gone to bed most nights, and so he slept on the stairs as to not interrupt her sleep. He started using tobacco and drinking during this period to help mitigate the stress of his life, habits that would keep hold of him until he died. After attending a charity concert on the 20th of April, 1832, organized by Niccolo Paganini for the victims of the Parisian cholera epidemic, Liszt was flooded with artistic inspiration. Paganini could play the violin as if it was an extension of his own body, a fluidity that Liszt wanted to achieve on the piano. There were many virtuosi of the piano in Paris at the time, including Sigmund Thalberg and Alexander Dreyschock, focused on specific aspects of technique, i.e. the three-hand effect and octaves, respectively. These players would focus on only one aspect of playing technique and refine it. Liszt, on the other hand, wanted complete control of the keyboard. He wanted to have his artistic spirit roll out of the instrument unimpeded by technique. He wanted to achieve levels where one does not perceive the fingers or the nails or the instrument. Liszt wanted to transubstantiate his flesh into art. He wrote to his pupil Pierre Wolf, for two weeks now, my mind and my fingers have been working like two lost souls. Homer, the Bible, Plato, Locke, Byron, Hugo, Lamartine, Schaubrand, Beethoven, Bach, Hummel, Mozart, Weber are all around me. I study them, meditate on them, devour them with fury. Besides this, I practice four or five hours of exercises, third, sixth, octaves, tremolos, repetition of notes, cadences, etc. Ah, as long as I don't go mad, you will find an artist in me. Yes, an artist such as the one you desire, such as required these days. And I too am a painter, cried Michelangelo at the first time he beheld a masterpiece. Your friend, though insignificant and poor can't stop repeating those words ever since Paganini's last performance. Rene, what a man, what a violin, what an artist, heavens. What sufferings, what misery, what tortures in those four strings. As far as his expression and his style of playing are concerned, they come from his very soul. 
Liszt's immediate aim was to transfer some of the playing feats of Paganini, such as tremolos, leaps, glissandos, spiccato effects, and bell-like harmonics to the piano, creating a new technique of playing. Liszt selected a group of Paganini's unaccompanied caprices, notorious for their difficulties, and set about reproducing them for the keyboard. What Liszt brought forth were the Paganini studies in 1838. He revised them 11 years later and renamed them Grandes Etudes de Paganini. The most well-known of these is the third one, La Campanella, which focuses on leaps and repeated notes. The goal was to create an etude that forced the pianist to keep a fluid melody in the middle of the piano while leaping with the same hand to repeated high notes that must sound effortless. Let's listen to the opening of this work now. At the beginning of 1833, Liszt met Marie de Algot, someone who would change his life forever. When they first met, Countess Marie de Algot was 28, unhappily married to a man 15 years her senior and the mother of two children. She was beautiful and elegant. They met in the salon of another great Paris hostess, Marquise Levere. Marie's diary, published by her as Memories, recorded her first sight of Liszt. Madame L.V. was still talking when the door opened and a wonderful apparition appeared before my eyes. I use the word apparition because I can find no other to describe the sensation aroused in me by the most extraordinary person I had ever seen. He was tall and extremely thin. His face was pale and his large sea green eyes shone like a wave when the sunlight catches it. His expression bore the marks of suffering. He moved indecisively and seemed to glide across the room in a distraught way, like a fan for whom the hour when it must return to the darkness is about to sound. Their torrid love affair began the next day when Liszt showed up at Marie's door after she sent him a note. After a few months, Marie left her husband and children, fleeing to Geneva with Liszt. She was pregnant with Liszt's first child, Ballandine. The couple made their home in Switzerland for the next four years, with Liszt journeying back to Paris every so often. Two more children were born of the couple, Cosima and Daniel. After Daniel was born, their relationship started to crack under the strain of Liszt's travels and Marie's wish for Liszt to abandon his artistic calling and be with her. When Liszt heard that the Beethoven Statue Committee in Bonn was about to fall into disarray from lack of fundraising, Liszt was determined to save the project by going on a concert tour of Europe. This led to the breakdown of Marie's and Liszt's relationship, and Marie moved back to Paris with their children while Liszt set off. They were to be in and out of each other's lives and the lives of their children until Marie's death in 1876. Liszt met with one of his spiritual mentors in 1834. Felicité Robert de la Menet was a French Catholic priest, philosopher, and political theorist. He was one of the most influential intellectuals of Restoration France. La Menet is considered the forerunner of liberal Catholicism and social Catholicism. His social ideas embraced enlarged suffrage, separation of church and state, universal freedom of conscience, instruction, assembly, and the press. Liszt wrote to the priest after reading his book Paroles d'une Croyante and Lamennais invited him to his chateau, Le Chanet. Liszt spent most of the summer of 1834 there in spiritual retreat, sitting at Lamennais' feet. The liberal Catholicism of Lamennais would put an indelible stamp on Liszt's philosophy of artists and art. Lamennais thought that art was God made manifest and it ennobled the human race. So an artist was like a priest ministering to his congregation. This prescription is one that Liszt took upon himself and acted out in his daily life. This would extend to his selfless promotion of worthy causes, playing for charity, and his drive to support other artists he found worthy. 
Liszt also spent his time at La Chenet composing and he found his mature voice. He wrote harmonies, poetiques, and religieuses, a revolutionary work called Leon, and his apparitions. The first apparition is a masterpiece, a quasi-improvisatory work with a focus on the use of chromaticism and rhythmic instability over an Italianate melody. Let's hear the opening of the work, where a churning left hand pairs with a right hand indulging in chromaticism until silence intervenes and writes the work, which then blossoms into a rich melody over a tremolo accompaniment. Let's hear that now. Thank you for joining me in this series about the life of Liszt. If you'd like to learn more about the composer, the best biography is a three-volume compendium by Alan Walker. This video is based on a lot of information I got from the first volume, Franz Liszt, The Virtuoso Years. A link to it can be found in the description box below. Like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. What do you want to learn about next? Leave me a comment down below. You can also support the making of these videos on Patreon. These videos take over 20 hours of research to complete, so Patreon is a great way to show your support. The bibliography for this video can be found on my website, dominiqueroyam.com. Interested in seeing my process? I document it on my social media, so follow me for more updates. My handles are listed below. Thanks again, and see you in my next video.